listening? It is I, Numator 479. According to our studies of your puny mammalian race, we discovered you like very good coffee. And while it is our evolutionary purpose to cause you psychic torment, we want you awake and vivacious to give it. So try our new blend from Spring Hill Jack Coffee, reptilian in the morning. Our proprietary blend of lightly roasted cocayo husks will have you immediately energized upon emerging from the pain cloaca with all your slippery new eggs. Thanks, honey. Hot, hot, I'm cold blooded. Ah. Mmm. Thanks to Spring Hill Jack and last podcast on the left, I'm ready to get out there and eat some babies. Get out of the way, Hillary Clinton. There's no place to escape to. This is the last podcast. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. So getting into this week's research, Marcus, um, it might be the COVID talking. Could be. Um, You're day four, right? Day four, COVID. Deep in it. It's helped, I think. I think it helped me understand this topic. Eddie, you don't know what's coming for you. Yeah. There isn't. I don't know what a vortex is, so that might need to be explained to me. This is a lot of math. <laughs> I'm going to bring out. I hope you brought your TI-89 from middle school. Um, but what do you do? All right. We mysterious triangles covered them before. Yeah. But what do you do when the haunted triangle is the entire state? Yeah. Like if it's the entire state, you can't avoid it. It's not the entire state. It's the entirety of the state that fits within the shape of a triangle. But it's, so it's not the entire shape because the state is not shaped as a triangle. It's, it's a giant state. I most know that of much. the state. It's most of the state. It's most of the state. This is the last yeah. podcast on the left. We're talking about the Alaska Triangle today. I'm Marcus Parks with Ed Larson, Henry Zabrowski. It's not the entire state. It's just as much of the state that can be fit inside a triangle. The only thing it's missing is like four beaches. And then no, those beaches, no, yeah, no. look at the, look there's at the triangle. That's there's a big triangle. You know? There's a peninsula, I believe, that is not included, an Alaskan peninsula that's there's not included. There's nobody there to go missing. <laughs> it's just a bunch of seals. See, I always thought the Alaska Triangle is what you see when Sarah Palin bends over. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. No. Yeah. Oh, Start, yeah. No yeah. prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> no prisoners. Fuck yeah, bro. Going back to 2012 topics with 2012 jokes. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. Check out her pussy, man. <laughs> Now, out of all the wild and woolly triangles around the world... There's so the, many triangles! There's 12. From the Bermuda to the Dragon to the Devils to the Bridgewater, one of the least talked about is the Alaska Triangle. Not anymore. Partly, that's because <laughs> nobody really noticed there was there even was an Alaska Triangle until very recently. Because it's most of the state. <laughs> it is the entire state of Alaska. People go missing. More people yeah. go missing... In Alaska, then live there in a year. Their state should be empty. Yeah. <laughs> no, they pay people to live there to go missing. That's why they pay people to live there. Wow. Interesting. So they can go missing. <laughs> yes. And is this all about Travel Channel? Is this Travel Channel fixing the books? Well, from what our research team can tell, there was no information on the internet at all about the Alaska Triangle before the year 2020, when the Travel Channel released a show called What Else But the Alaska Triangle, which has since released two seasons. Did you watch any of it? I watched the first episode, yeah. I watched the entire first season. Well, you had COVID time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got it. <laughs> I watched the entire first season. And guess what is the most, the really most legit thing you can say about the travel channels, you know, when they go into this subject, the invitation to the subject. The only true thing is you can say is that they did travel to Alaska, <laughs> but nothing else within it is technically helpful yeah. or yeah. real. I don't know, but it's very compelling. You never know. Well, consequently, a book was released thereafter by a character named Mike Ricksecker called Alaska's Mysterious Triangle, which is basically a promo piece for the Travel Channel show and mentions the series at least once in every chapter because Mike Ricksecker is in the TV show quite a bit. Mm. It's also, there, man. He's also an ancient aliens guy. Oh, okay. oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is this brings out all the stops. Um, There's a lot of people in here that are ju they just say stuff like, you know, Alaska. Well, you know, the Greys. They love the cold. 
They're just saying <laughs> stuff. There's a lot, but Alaska is dangerous. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I mean, and to be fair, we say that no one's talked about the Alaska Triangle until 2020, but nobody knew about the Bermuda Triangle until a book was released about that subject in 1974. And the Bermuda Triangle is now as much a part of our collective consciousness as Bigfoot or crop circles. We all, we, everyone knows what the Bermuda Triangle is. Yes. But we do know, yes, while there is a mysterious vortex that lies in the center of the Bermuda Triangle that allows people to travel through wormholes, we do also know the main problem with the Bermuda Triangle is ocean farts. Because <laughs> ocean farts is literally what brings planes down. We talked about this. Yeah, we know this. Because yeah, yeah. methane bubbles, methane bubbles come out of the water and it makes planes lose air buoyancy and they fall into the water. What I want to know is when's the Bermuda Triangle going to start pulling its weight and cleaning up some of this plastic? <laughs> That's, what we, need. Plastic yeah, that's, that's what, what we need. That's what we need the vortex for. Send that shit to fucking Bigfoot land. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, Eddie, because then, oh, you're shifting the problem to Bigfoot. Now it's Bigfoot's fucking problem in his world of neutrinos. Yeah. No, He's you... got nothing to do. <laughs> He's got nothing to do. <laughs> He's just wandering around the forest doing jack shit. I'm on Eddie's side. Fucking send it to Bigfoot put land. Let him deal with it. Give him no. a job. No, he has give him a job. Built- if they're gonna if they're gonna fucking wander around America, give him a, give him a job. He could build a hive out of it or something. <laughs> they all live in hives, right? Their jobs <laughs> are to help us spiritually ascend. All right, you didn't get to you didn't read the book about the psychic Bigfoot talking to the author who talked about how he's trying. They're trying to help us spiritually, intellectually. They're reading books. Yeah. Bigfoot's oh, are I'm busy. getting this in right now. He says, <laughs> "I'm done. <laughs> I'm already frustrated." <laughs> You must learn, Eddie. This is a part of your. This is a part of your education. This is a part of your education. We're we're starting at the beginning. We start with triangles, and we're going to get to vorta- vortices. Yeah, uh, and we get to equilaterals. I'm fucked. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's not geometry. <laughs> Well, the difference between the Bermuda Triangle and the Alaska Triangle is that the Alaska Triangle is mostly land. In fact, the Alaska Triangle, admittedly, is pretty much the maximum amount of Alaskan land mass that can fit inside the shape of a triangle. It's the entire state but the tips. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the Bering Sea as well. There's a lot of water involved, which we'll get to. Now, one of the most bold claims made in both the book and the TV show is that 16,000 people have gone missing in the Alaska Triangle in the last 30 years. But we're not sure where those stats came from because Alaska didn't start recording missing people until 1988. Okay. 16,000 in 30 years is also an incredible number when compared to the rest of the United States. For comparison, Hawaii and Oklahoma are tied for second and third when it comes to missing persons. Oh, wow. At 16 per 100,000 residents. Yeah. Alaska, meanwhile, has 173 missing people per 100,000. That's fucking nuts. Besides just the vortexes um, and vortices, and vortices. besides alien abductions, and besides um, U.S. The, government, the wild kid. Still, yeah, besides that kid, that was just one. And he did that to himself. Right. Besides all that, you do. I, I feel like a lot of it can be, you know, we we've talked about it. Remember when we covered Robert Hansen? We talked about Alaska's frontier land. I mean, yeah, the common sense reasons for this outside of mysterious triangle energies are, you know, most obvious. Alaska is extraordinarily dangerous. It's sparsely populated and it's twice the size of Texas. You could fit Texas, California, and Montana into Alaska and then still have more space. Jesus, I don't want to really? go. I, I don't yeah. want to go anywhere. They're all in a triangle. <laughs> They're all, and all of those states are inside of a single triangle of danger. <laughs> <laughs> well, additionally, Alaska, Hawaii, and Oklahoma all have large indigenous populations. As we know, when indigenous people go missing, their disappearances are far less likely to be investigated. So a possible murder often gets filed away as a missing person because nobody could be bothered to look into the report at all. But even though the people missing off the ground may have common sense explanations, the many disappearances are merely a companion piece, hmm. a side dish, if you will. The yams. <laughs> mm. The yams. I'm, I'm, I've got special yams. I make yams. A very good yam. We we had them this year. They you did very well. They were very Thank good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. But that's merely the yams <laughs> to the overall phenomenon <laughs> that is the Alaska Triangle. Yes, but you guess what you're leaving out, man? Pyramids, dog. <laughs> because what is pyramid before triangles? Right? Yeah, yeah. And pyramids no, I remember. also come into play 
Yeah. No, I remember the period. Actually, I was when I was a very lazy little boy, I did a science fair experiment where I built a pyramid out of cardboard and straws and I made a little cardboard camel. And my entire argument was, did you know that a pyramid is four triangles? It's deeper than you think. And you and know what square. else? I- <laughs> oh, yeah. The no, the bottom you know- is that the bottom is the fourth uh, triangle. Is it? Yeah. Oh, so it's three. Wow. Well, no, pyramids are four triangles. Wow. Pyramids four tri- He's right. Pyramid yeah. is technically four triangles and a square. I got to go. Wait, I got to go. I got to get out of here. No, it's not. It's one, leave. two, three, and then the bottom is the fourth. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's depending on the pyramid. Uh, but I also got a book called Pyramids Around the World by Doctor of Science Samir Osmoganovich, who says that, hey, did you know pyramids can also be circles? <laughs> Go fuck yourself, dude. <laughs> Pyramid. <laughs> Guess what I learned through my travels with COVID? Yes, I might have COVID. And I've had a lot of edibles. And I've spent hours and hours and hours listening to Linda Moulton Howe and Travel Channel. But guess what? Pyramid's just vibe, dog. Yeah. <laughs> so, a cir- so you're saying that a circle is like can be a pyramid if it feels like it's a pyramid. Yes. And if it has the same properties as a pyramid, but it's no. still a circle. It's just got pyramid shit. It's got a pyramid <laughs> lifestyle. And then it shows up. It's, it's used for something else. Because what do we know about pyramids? Some people think that the, oh, oh, that they're just, you know, monuments built to remembrance and to the, the vivaciousness of the human spirit. To that, I say, fuck you, you moron. They're full of cats. <laughs> full of cats. Number one, they're vets <laughs> slash shelters. And then two, it is a fucking wormholes dog. and. Do you know that triangles naturally create energy? Is that true? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, when it comes to the definition of a wild and woolly triangle in the paranormal world, it usually refers to a gateway or window of focused, unexplained activity. Usually, they encompass missing planes, ships, and people, in addition to cryptids, hauntings, UFOs, and other analogous phenomena. The most famous, of course, is the aforementioned Bermuda Triangle, which was chronicled as far back as 1492 as a place where strange things happen. Yep. None other than Christopher Columbus recorded erratic compass readings. Erratic. (laughs) That's the top. That's the word of the day. Erratic. Erratic compass readings while sailing in the Bermuda Triangle and wrote that he saw flames plummet into the ocean along with what he called a small wax candle being raised and lowered in the night sky. But he didn't realize that was just him in the bath with an erection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Watch it just slash back and forth. I yeah. used to yeah, do that. Christopher, Christopher Columbus had a bright orange Cheeto-colored penis. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Purely, pure Italian, man. You're a little medical. <laughs> Now, according to those who believe that there's something paranormal about these triangles, outside of naturally occurring electromagnetic phenomena, these areas contain vortices of energy. Vortices being the plural of vortex. You don't say vortexes. You say vortices. Vortices. From, you're from Fort <laughs> Texas, right? <laughs> no, Fort Texas is where the anime convention is held every year. Yeah. <laughs> well, from, what, <laughs> well, from what believers say, these vortices of energy build up in the Earth's core and cause strange phenomena to suddenly transpire, like unusual weather patterns, bizarre electromagnetic anomalies, and coolest of all, interdimensional portals. Shit, yeah, dude, fucking international portals, dogs, fucking bus station to fucking Bigfoot land, dog. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> this stuff is very stupid, but there is a, maybe it's got something to do with, yes, some vortices are created by natural rock formations. And they talk about the, you know, the idea of the where, especially, you know, natural water sources mixed with certain types of rocks create energetic properties. They believe there's also, again, just triangles being mm-hmm. what they are, natural flows of energy. But if you stuck up a, all right, you make a triangle erect, it's a pyramid, energy flows up. What if I told you that at the very epicenter of the Alaska Triangle, center of the state, there is a hidden obsidian pyramid underneath the ground, bigger than the Giza pyramids, my friend, that the U.S. government has been slowly but surely using an energy diaper. That is a term that I have heard where they <laughs> line it with electronic. It is, they're pumping energy to an underground pyramid in order to, Fuel the dew line, 
right? Which I'll explain later in order that that is creating a series of anomalous events inside of Alaska. Now, of an underground pyramid, why not just put it in a mountain? Hmm. Because I guess if you put the, uh, the pyramid in a mountain... It's difficult. It's just, it's just a, it's just a mountain. It's, it's difficult. Just a mountain. To, it's difficult to hollow out a mountain. Yeah. But it's easier to but dig a hole. To, okay. But, but according to <laughs> Travel Channel, it's actually extremely even more, even more possible to build a pyramid. But the only people who could do it, obviously, are aliens. And yeah. They live underground. And a lot of big people keep talking about the Travel Channel, too. But they're like, pyramids? Why do these people keep burying them under dirt? And it's like, it's been there for thousands of years. I think dirt naturally accrues. Dirt they assume, no, they assume that people are just literally covering them up with dirt. Interesting. Yeah. How mad would you be if you were a slave and you built a pyramid and at the end of it, the Pharaoh's like, bury it! Hate it! <laughs> Hate it! But now we know, Eddie, a lot of them were cultured artisans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was definitely humans who built the pyramids. Yeah. The humans built the pyramids. Oh, it had to be. Yeah, it had to be. Yeah. Not according to, not according to Linda Moulton Howe. Yeah. And also Mike Ricksecker. Also very, very, he is very much on the side that everything is Atlantis and mm -hmm. everything came from Atlantis and everything that we have ever had in the ancient world is all Atlanteans. White Atlanteans. Oh, Rick Secker, we should use for like a bullshit artist. It's like, <laughs> yes. it's like a term for that. From now on. Yeah, right. He has a real Rick Secker. Because <laughs> it sounds like a slur, but it's not. It really does. <laughs> it does. It's fun to say. You fucking Rick Seckers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that last phenomena, the interdimensional portals, that brings us to our first story of the Alaska Triangle. Because when there's possible interdimensional portals, there's also going to be stories of airplanes vanishing from the air without a trace. Popping in and out. <laughs> now, according to Mike Rexecker, Alaska is particularly sensitive to the creations of vortices and portals because of solar flares and the aurora borealis. Yeah. Which does, in fact, interfere with electronic equipment and GPS navigation. That part is true. Alaska's closer to the sky. Yeah. Okay. Now, I just might. said that. I just said that. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and I agreed with you because it sounded good and I assumed you knew what you were talking about. Nope. There's high mountains there. I mean, technically, you know, those could be closer than the sky. Yeah. The only thing I do know is about the obsidian pyramid underneath the the dirt of Alaska. It's the only thing I actually know about today. And the dew lines. Yep. I'm into it. <laughs> yeah now one might say that the aurora borealis just makes exploration and travel in alaska more dangerous because proven scientific phenomena plays haywire with the instruments humans use to locate and orient themselves especially in the sky nope but, <laughs> <laughs> but from what mike ricksecker claims these currents of energy ebb and flow, meaning that Alaska is more prone to paranormal phenomena at certain times. And if we hadn't lost our knowledge from the ancient world, mainly from Atlantis, we'd know what the fuck all this was about. But we did and we don't. Mm. They paid a big, I guess they, 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 you know, well, they wiped themselves out with their own thermonuclear device. We know this yeah. to be true. They all wipe themselves their own ther thermonuclear device and just as some, you know, deserts are now green spaces and some green spaces are now deserts, so too did Atlantis become buried underneath the flood, in the antediluvian flood. Oh. Just pick it up Atlantis. as... Eddie, just pick it up as you go. You know, Each time you go, like, just, just let in what you can let in and then discard. I can yeah. relate. Now, you know that Donovan song, Atlantis, right? No, I don't. You don't? I, I never got too into Donovan. This is the one you're going to love. I'll send it to you okay. as, afterwards, way down in the ocean where I want to be. It's, yeah. it's, it'll tell you everything you need to know about Atlantis. Oh. When I was a kid, Atlantis was the name of the water park in Fort Lauderdale. I used to go all the time. And then, ironically, it got wiped away by Hurricane Andrew. Oh, wow. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Alaska is a place where people disappear, and while most sadly go unnoticed, some disappearances over the years have become national mysteries. Back in 1972, U.S. Majority Leader Hale Boggs and an Alaskan congressman named Nick Begick took off... <laughs> it's the worst name I've ever heard in my life. Terrible name. There's a lot of bad names today, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Hale Boggs, Nick Begick. Uh, Rick Secker. <laughs> Rick Secker. <laughs> they took off from Anchorage, Alaska at 9 a.m. on their way to Juneau for a fundraising drive, following a well-worn flight path in a twin-engine Cessna. But before their plane reached the Portage Pass, communication was lost and the plane disappeared from radar. Alaska. <laughs> 
The largest search and rescue mission of the day was mounted soon after, which logged 3,600 man hours and covered 325,000 square miles. But despite all efforts, no sign of the four passengers nor their plane was ever seen again. Alaska. Trying. <laughs> now, yeah, they might have flown through a portal. Yeah. But, <laughs> but what's interesting is that while Mike Ricksecker's whole argument is that wild shit happens in the Alaska Triangle, he still pushes a bit of conspiracy on the disappearance of Hale Boggs. He just can't fucking help himself. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Hale Boggs had dissented against the Warren Commission in 1963. Targeters fucking back. <laughs> when they concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald and his magic bullets had been the only factor surrounding the assassination of JFK. Why it took nine years for the government to retaliate to this dissension is unclear. They never it's, forget, man. They never forget, and they want to wait till you forget, dog. And there you, by that point, everyone had forgotten about the JFK assassination. Yeah. So why not let it, you know, it's already went under the radar. And so not even think about it. It's all, yeah, it was yeah. nine years. That's a long nine time. Years. Mike Ricksecker also hints that because Boggs was of Croatian heritage, Whoa. he may have been targeted by Serbians for reasons that are unclear. Jealous of Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> While the podcast Missing in Alaska about the disappearance of Hale Boggs revealed that a mafioso told the FBI that the plane had been bombed. And nothing is more reliable than an yeah. out-of-work <laughs> mafioso. <laughs> nothing. You always listen. They're always not full of shit. Yeah, you guys remember uh, Hell Boggs? Don't yeah. remember that Hell Boggs? I did that. <laughs> he's part I of the that. Fairbanks gang. <laughs> yeah, you know how he's wet a whip. You know what they say? No, he's swimming with the penguins. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. Um, it is. Uh, it's dangerous above Alaska, but it's funny because each guys they always say this too. They're all like, and there is no way the plane would ever go missing. On Alaska. It is one of the most observed areas of space. That's what they say about the flight area of Alaska. Yeah, right? we're about to get into that. We're about to get into that. Because the disappearance of Boggs' plane was but one of many in the Alaska Triangle. And it is by no means the most mysterious. See, it would be very easy for a small Cessna to disappear into the Alaskan wilderness. There's not a lot of mystery there. But the same could not be said of a Douglas C-54 Skymaster. According to Travel Channel, the most important plane to have ever been built. Most important plane? More than Air Force One? It was used a lot. The most, most important plane model. Oh, okay. No, they said that this one plane <laughs> was one of the most important special planes. They did. I'm only they here. I'm, I, watched that, I watched that episode. They made no such claim. They said it's special plane. This plane <laughs> could talk. <laughs> you're, you're COVID. Wow, I'm really seeing how much your COVID brain is really like filtering shit through. I, I, you know... I don't know what's going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> well, in January of 1950, a Douglas Skymaster took off from Elmendorf Air Force Base near Anchorage, bound for Montana, with dozens of people aboard. The Douglas, one of the most used military aircraft of the day, had a 100-foot wingspan, three times larger than the average Cessna. But just as the plane passed over the small Alaskan town of Snag, Ugh. <laughs> I know, Snag, Alaska. Yeah, it's an awful name. It's, it's Alaska's full of Skagway. Yeah, Gufton. That's a good name for a town. <laughs> no, it happened when one of the pioneers' wives got her panties stuck on a fucking walrus. <laughs> Yeah, Name it Snag. Name it Snag. After my like wife. After my wife's vagina. <laughs> Well, as the plane was passing over Snag, it disappeared from radar and was never seen again. Now, remember, this was 1950, right when the Cold War was heating up. And since Alaska is right next to Russia, the sky above Alaska is one of the most surveilled places on the planet. So for a plane like this to just disappear was a big fucking deal. And it was not in the military's best interest to leave a plane with possibly sensitive material aboard lying around in the wilderness for the Ruskies to find. Because they're right or, there. should I say, the Ruskies. The Ruskies. They're right there and they're waiting. And because we also had to have it's the dew line. Right, so the dew line was a series of radio towers that are supposed to uh, warn us if the Ruskies are coming over to bomb us. So they, they ping so it's extra surveilled and they don't know how it could remotely be possible. But now that we saw that when we blew those objects over the sky uh, in Alaska and we went to go look for it at the beginning of this year, we couldn't find, well, last year, we couldn't find jack shit. 
So the do line is power. That do line that is there to look for, you know, Russian missiles. That's powered by the Obsidian Pyramid underground. The Dark Pyramid, yeah, absolutely. Doug Muchley, he, he talks a lot about it, and it's like it, it, powered how? by energy. Di- the conduit is an energy diaper. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I read all about this, and we don't know exactly how we do it. We just know that if you put energy into the corners of the pyramid, it actually flows out of the tip much harder. Ah. Uh-huh. So it's cum. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In a sense, isn't everything. Proteons. It's protons. But even though every effort was made to find the Douglas, no trace of the crew nor the wreckage was ever found. In fact, people are still looking for the Douglas. A couple of years ago, a bunch of guys put a bunch of drones out in Alaska to explore unreachable areas. Found nothing. Yeah, it's just fucking gone, dog. It's yeah. big. It's a big state. Yeah. yeah. And it, but it's also, it's a big plane. It could be buried by now. Yeah, it could be. A couple trees fall down. You're not finding that fucking thing. No, you're not. Eddie, nothing naturally gets buried. Okay? Everything must be purposely buried. (laughs) You just said pyramids get buried. Yeah, by people. By people. Oh, okay. (laughs) You're right. I'm sorry, Henry. (laughs) You're out of your league here, buddy. I know what's going on here. I'm glad you're bringing your humility to this. (laughs) I'm really appreciating it. (laughs) But what makes the disappearance of the Douglas more interesting in the triangle realm, as opposed to the Boggs' disappearance, is what happened before and after. Four days after the Douglas went missing, a garbled cryptic radio message was supposedly intercepted in the Yukon, followed by two more garbled cryptic radio messages. I couldn't find, though, what those cryptic messages were. Help! <laughs> help! It's, that's it's not, cold! That's, that's not cryptic at all. That's just it's cold. Help! 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 There's a guy, this, this little penguin, is playing with my helmet. <laughs> no, you, you is, can't find me. You. <laughs> <laughs> they said that that is exactly why we know for a fact that they were abducted by aliens. Well, additionally, a couple days before the disappearance, a Navy pilot clocked a UFO going an estimated 1,800 miles per hour in the same area where the Douglas disappeared. Hmm. Now, there's an extreme amount of electromagnetic energy in the Alaska Triangle due to its proximity to the North Pole and the Northern Lights and so on and so forth. So it is possible that the Douglas entered into a magnetic anomaly which caused its instruments to go haywire because back then, most uh, on-flight instruments were magnetic. Yeah. Well, Doug Mutchley, who was a counterintelligence officer, uh, for the CIA, I, I must be real. He said that this is this is a story that he told to people was that he was uh, working on a base in Alaska and he turned on his television at night and he saw a documentary that talked about the idea that these dark pyramids underneath Alaska are creating electronic anomalies, attracting UFOs. And he saw this whole thing, say, talked about the wonders and powers of pyramids and how pyramids are natural batteries and they can be used uh, they've been used since time immemorial to to fuel machines and technology that we don't have access to anymore because it was blown up by atlanteans right and all of that stuff went by the way of like it's now sunk to the bottom of the ocean we can't find it anymore we can't get it back no way right and so he saw this documentary and he went down to the station he said he was so incensed and so inspired by the documentary he went down to the station and said I want a copy for myself and guess what they told him we never played that <laughs> and then they said they're like what and then a guy some other guy he refuses to name because he's not a stool pigeon he pulled him aside and he says like they don't want us to know they don't want anybody to know that the reason why people are going missing here and what's going on here is that we've accidentally opened up a wormhole using that pyramid and that's why we can only show that documentary once <laughs> right, which I don't even know why they can. I don't know why they can show it multiple times. But he said to him, "It's like when Bill they Cooper found. I can only show it once. I can only show it once. It was like Bill Cooper found the secrets of the Illuminati in the Xerox machine. Yeah, <laughs> right. But you yeah, can only we'll find get, it we'll once. Tell you all about that one. But they go and they just said, and so then he got invited to be a part of this top secret pyramid project when they went down there, and they were all just being like, we don't know what the fuck this thing does, but it does suck people into a hole." Well, if you believe that UFOs are interdimensional craft rather than intergalactic, which makes more sense scientifically, Mm -hmm. you know why? Because space is far? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) You got it. Yeah. 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 (laughs) There are assholes who will spend fucking three hours saying the exact same thing. (laughs) 
<laughs> that, that you just said uh, in three words, spaces, because yeah, space Eddie, is far. Four you're words. ruining your career as a talking head in the paranormal space. space you have to find far. You have to find new and longer ways to say that. <laughs> but if you believe that they're interdimensional craft rather than intergalactic, then it's possible that these electromagnetic energies might also somehow be portals to another dimension. Okay. This claim is paired with the aforementioned garbled radio transmissions that follow the disappearance of the Douglas, which leads some to speculate that these messages may have come through the portal the Douglas disappeared into, which is the same portal the UFO came out of. Alaska. Triangle. Square. <laughs> <laughs> it's everywhere. If you're in Alaska, it's everywhere. Shame. You know what they say about interdimension travel? Dimensional. <laughs> One too far. <laughs> Step too far. I liked it. I, I liked it. I mean, we, we have to dimension it or else there isn't a show. <laughs> there isn't a show. Like, yeah, they get into it. <laughs> no. It's, <laughs> it's not no, good. <laughs> Live from your grave. Now, as far as a possible portal in Alaska goes, Mike Ricksecker believes that he found a vortex outside of Anchorage. After scanning the face of Flat Top Mountain with a set of dowsing rods and an electromagnetic field meter, he said he found definite signs of a, quote, swelling of the Earth's energy, indicating a vortex. Who's funding this guy? <laughs> Himself. Oh. Himself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Eddie. A lot of this comes from truly, it's private money. There oh, is some okay. of that. Some of these guys get, you know, Robert Bigelow. He was the billionaire that funded all of NIDS and the people that did, did all the Skinwalker Ranch research societies. They find people with money uh, they, they'll, and they'll spend it looking for UFOs. I can't wait. Yeah. Hey, you Have you funded any searches? I gave MUFON plenty of money. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him too much money. <laughs> that doesn't mean because Mike Ricksecker found the vortex outside of Anchorage that a bunch of UFOs are suddenly going to spurt out of a mountain because a vortex is not a portal. Rather, the electromagnetic power of a vortex creates a portal. Okay. See? Or it can be used to create a portal if yeah. interdimensional beings are indeed using these portals as interdimensional highways. Like the mist. Like the, yeah, like the mist. Like the mist. But we talk about, you know, pyramids, the center of this. So you have to turn, this is the very center of this. It's, it's all shapes. Pyramids are a part of this. Is that if you turn them on, that's a part of the issue with the dark pyramid. That using all of the, using this kind of weird governmental the process we did, this weird experiment we did, the Dark Pyramid, we accidentally popped open a, vorte a vortex. Could be. So it's like Moses and the mist, which is great. You know, that pyramids. I don't. He was around pyramids, Moses. Moses? He ran from them. He, yeah, he was afraid of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he drop his baby off and I was at the river? Yeah, that was the river, yeah. yeah. Now, he was the baby, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he was the baby. Yeah, he was the baby. I stopped reading comic books a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but concerning triangles like the Alaska Triangle, while vortices do appear randomly, they appear far more often in the triangles, which is supposedly why so many planes and people and ships and cars and so so on and so forth go missing in these areas. This, of course, can be explained further if we ever return to the subject of the 12 vile vortices. Ooh. But while there have been many, many Cessnas, Pipers, and various other twin-engine planes that have disappeared in the Alaska Triangle, i.e. Alaska, over the decades, there have been just as many maritime disasters that have occurred in the seas contained therein. That's a fucked up ocean. It really is. Alaska's very dangerous. Yeah. Now again, yes, the Bering Sea yeah. is extremely dangerous. And sh uh, ships are lost in its waters every single year. But within the Triangle, the ships that are lost seem to have a spookier edge. Yeah. That's what makes it fun. That's yeah. what makes it good. It's spooky. <laughs> the earliest account of a spooky ship is from 1761, concerning a ship called the Octavius that was sailing back to England from China through the Northwest Passage. That's far. Yeah, 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 real far. The legend is that the ship disappeared, but almost 15 years later, another ship happened upon the wreck of the Octavius and found all 28 men Frozen dead in their quarters. That makes That's fucking sense. sweet. Yeah, yeah. The eyes yeah. open in a state of fear. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 
The next ship to earn a story came over 100 years later in 1898, when a ship called the Clara Nevada ran aground and exploded near Seward, Alaska, although the circumstances surrounding its destruction were not in any way mysterious. (laughs) Rather, what is mysterious is what came after. Oh, okay. Because then it's like, why then? Why are we, we talking, talking about, about it? it? Yeah. yeah. yeah so why did it explode? I'll get to you. Okay. During the Klondike gold rush of the 1890s, the modern equivalent of $6 million in gold was boarded onto the Clara Nevada, presumably for a trip to Vancouver or the lower 48, which wasn't the best idea considering the shape of the ship. What's the See, shape? The cla- ship shape. Shape of the ship. Shape of the ship's bad. See, the Clara Nevada had formerly been a government survey ship called the Hassler. Whoa. Which is a great name for a boat. Oh, it is. Yeah. Especially a, a survey ship. <laughs> hey, yeah. what are you doing in there? Let me see that. Let me see that. Hey, oh my God. Oh my God. Hey, this hey. is my other boat, the fuck face. <laughs> <laughs> but the Hassler was retired after 25 years of service in 1897 when it was deemed unfit for further service. Oh, it was in bad shape. I thought it was like a horseshoe shape. <laughs> I thought it was literally like a bad shape. Bro. No, no, it was not like a, talking a lot of not shapes. a bad physical shape. I'm There's talking about it was damaged and not fit for sea travel, especially in one of the most dangerous seas in the world. Did you know a circle could be a pyramid? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what Stonehenge is. Stonehenge is a circular pyramid, bro. Same function. There are no. It's no. It's not a pyramid. It's not a pyramid. There are no, no pyramids. There are nothing. It is a circle with made of rectangles. It's a vibe, dog. You never understand. You'll never, you'll never get it. But yeah. there's no roof. Y'all, the, too old. A pyramid needs a roof. Y'all boomers don't understand what's going on with pyramids. And they're fucking styly, dude. Pyramid styly. Well, concerning the Hassler, the Pacific and Alaska Transportation Company decided it was just fine. And after some minor refits, it was rechristened the Clara Nevada and sent back out to sea. Within a year, though, a fire broke out on board. The boiler exploded and six million in gold sank to the bottom of the Bering Sea, never to be found again. Man, we got to go get it. We got to go get it, dude. You got to go get that six million dollars? Yeah, man. I'd like to be, yeah, fuck, be an Alaska treasure hunter in the Bering yeah, Sea. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. That's a way to die within like a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is slow suicide. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm well, not slow. It's pretty quick suicide. No, be, no, no, be no I, I got it. Who knows but, how long you'd be there? Quiet suicide. That's quiet suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years later, though, after a lighthouse was constructed nearby, people began seeing the ghost of the Clara Nevada sailing the seas on particularly spooky nights. Cool. But the most tragic of the Alaskan naval disasters was the sinking of the SS Princess Sophia. In 1918, this passenger liner went down with 353 souls aboard, all of whom died terrible, agonizing deaths. Man, I remember I could I just recently a Quora thing popped up on my Gmail where it's like, you know, they sent me randomly like whatever the, the best. And the thing it said was, do you think that the victims of 9-11 died instantly? So, Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. <laughs> well, no, they've just plenty of pictures of them jumping out of the building. And yeah. Actually, there was many different ways that they died. Some slow, some in fire, some covered, <laughs> some suffocated. And it was just like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Cora, man, what a disappointment. Sad there. Now, the Sophia was a relatively new ship. It had set sail six years earlier, the same year that the Titanic had sunk, 1912. And in fact, it had been fitted with new buoyancy tanks following the disaster of the Titanic presumably to better keep the Sophia afloat should it hit ice. But on October 24th, 1918, just after the Sophia left the port of Skagway, a snowstorm blew in, bringing 50-mile-per-hour winds that blew the ship to and fro. And even though the captain was confident that they would reach their destination of Vancouver, the Sophia crashed into the Vanderbilt Reef at around 2 a.m. Yeah, we got it! Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, we're going back and forth. But what are you going to do? All right, come on. We can take it. All right. Now, the Sophia was able to immediately send out a distress call. And that call was received. But the storm was so intense that no rescue attempt could be made. So the passengers on board were told that they'd just have to wait it out. But after 40 hours of constant bad weather, the wind and the waves finally lifted the stern of the Sophia off the reef and spun the ship around. The hull tore and spilled the ship's oil into the sea while the ice water that flowed into the breach 
caused the boilers to explode. None of this is good. This is like, I don't like boats, man. I'm supposed to go on a cruise this summer. I don't want to go, dude. You're, oh, you'll be you're fine. You're going out of Florida. Yeah. And you're if you're getting fine, the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to get the shits. Yeah. It's just a big Petri dish. Yeah. I know. I'm going to get dysentery. Yeah. 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 Well, at that point, all the passengers had to abandon ship, but the lifeboats were far too small to survive such a storm. Those who did make it to the water in the boats were quickly sunk or thrown overboard. And everyone who ended up in the frozen water were either dead from hypothermia within minutes or were suffocated by the oil in the water. That's the bad way to go. I think I'd rather die of hypothermia because then you kind of just go to sleep. I think I think that's how it goes. Side stories, LPOTL at gmail.com. I'm pretty certain that you just kind of slide into nothingness when you have hyperthermia, where it's like if you're choking on oil while you're swimming, that's it's bad. That's a bad I mean, way. either way, it's a fucking horrible. Yeah, it's a horrible death. <laughs> yeah. But hypothermia, you just kind of go to sleep. No, well, I, I guess. I guess if they, I had to choose a horrible way to die, cold to death is the best. Cold to death is way better than hot to death. Yes. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. We covered the, uh, this elderly couple that got steamed to death on side stories this week. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Yeah. 120. Their uh, boiler set itself to a thousand degrees. Whoa. And when they were discovered, the house was 120 degrees and uh, they had both like died and suffocated in their beds. All I got right, good. I'll I got it. <laughs> yeah, I got good emails. that were basically saying it sounds like when the kids were fucking with the, the heater to fix it, they shut off the governor. Yeah, because it's supposed to shut off on its own, but it went to a thousand degrees. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, or it tried making it to a thousand degrees. It made it to one twenty, and the furnace was glowing so red hot that the basement looked like it was on fire. Yeah, wow. man, that's the American dream. Yeah, the only survivor of the Sophia, though, there was one survivor. It was a dog. Hey. In, 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 that's because a dog ain't got a soul. <laughs> Oh, that's not true. <laughs> it was an English setter who was found covered in oil days later, 20 miles from the crash site, starving and shaken, but otherwise unharmed. Wow. Aww. What a good doggy. It's such a good doggy. Yeah. And it went on to be the dog that chose who went to the camps. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> now, the mystery of the Princess Sophia was not necessarily why it sank, but the circumstances leading up to the crash. Now, the ship was a few hours behind schedule leaving the port of Skagway. So it could be, you know, it, they're going, they would go fast, try to make yeah. up some time. But the captain, a one Leonard Locke, was pushing the ship at almost three times the normal speed through a labyrinth of dangerous islands, islets, and fjords. Hey, man, it's all about making good time, dog. One hand on the bottle, one hand on the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> this was also in the middle of a storm that was so bad that visibility was brought down to zero. Therefore, by the time the ship slammed into the Vanderbilt Reef at 11 knots, it was a mile and a half off course. The question is why this 25 years a master maritime pilot was being so reckless. Hmm. Could it be that he was trying to escape something? Could it be? Or could it be that he was chasing something? Alaska. Ooh. Dry. This is at the tip. This is <laughs> the tip of one of these triangles, man. <laughs> Another interesting aspect of the Alaska Triangle is its long-lived ghost ships, namely the abandoned USS Bay Chimo, a.k.a. the ghost ship of the Arctic. It's sad because we, we do want to do a whole series on ghost ships, but they really just kind of show up. Yeah. I yeah. mean, to be clear, ghost ships in this context, they're not the ghosts of ships. Yeah. They're abandoned ships that drift through the seas. Yeah, exactly. I do find them interesting. Yeah. But they, it is just, we were going to do a whole episode of it, but it's really just a boat floating there. Yep. Yeah. And With so there's, containers. there's yeah. not a lot of meat in the episode. You know, not a lot of stories. It's just a boat. Someone goes like, oh, we don't need a boat no more. And then yeah. they leave the boat. And the boat just keeps floating. Well, they might die mysteriously, but we'll never know. And we yeah. have no idea what happens inside of it, but now it's just a boat drifting. And so, yes, on one level, it is extremely mysterious and it's very compelling. But if you do a 45-minute episode about something, you can't just have it be a boat floating there because a lot of boats just float there. Yep. Why not sink them? The ghost ships? Yeah. Because they're good like boats. I think people like having them around. I mean, yeah, they're, they're good fun. boats. Yeah. They're, the yeah. boats are fine. The boats have held. Yeah. Well, in the case of the ghost ship of the Arctic, a 1,300-ton cargo ship called the Bay Chimo got stuck in the ice in the year 1931, so the crew had no choice but to go ashore and make camp. 
A month later, a blizzard dislodged the ship from the ice when the crew wasn't looking, and it was briefly lost. The crew found it soon enough, but abandoned it after unloading its cargo of valuable furs, thinking it would soon sink. Instead, the USS Bechimo survived for decades, drifting about the Arctic seas. While sightings of it were in the dozens, every so often a crew would try to board the ship and commandeer it. But it always managed to get stuck in ice, <laughs> after which it would be abandoned again, then it would let itself loose again, and then someone else would try to get it. See, I can't tell if that's a good ship or a bad ship. I think like, it's a bad it ship. Because it didn't sink, but it kept getting stuck. It sounds like a cursed ship. Yeah. It's very, it's weird to have a ship that keeps losing itself. Yeah. You know, like it goes out there. It's like letting out a horse. It's like a let out Wendy. <laughs> Wendy can sort of find her way back on some level, but then she's just going to, she, she doesn't know. The last time the Bechimo was seen was in 1969 when the ship, you guessed it, got stuck in ice. Wow. A final search was mounted in 2006, but it seems like the ghost ship of the Arctic has finally found a resting place somewhere in the Alaska Triangle. Alaska Triangle. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the vortices we spoke of earlier aren't necessarily just portals for UFOs. According to Mike Ricksecker, these interdimensional portals can cause or make possible damn near any paranormal phenomena, including time travel. This I love. In Mike's opinion, time travel works like the 1980 Christopher Reeve movie Somewhere in Time, written by Twilight Zone alum Richard Matheson. You know that movie? I've never seen it, but I would love to. You read? You seen it, Henry? No, uh, Richard Matheson is one of my favorite authors in the world. I've actually never heard of this movie. Yeah, he wrote a book, and he also wrote the screenplay for, yeah, this Christopher Reeve movie. In this movie, Christopher Reeve hypnotizes himself so he can time travel to 1912 so he can have sex with Jane Seymour, which he does. Hey, man. That's good, good, good enough reason to say it. Yeah, he's like, he, she shows up, like a, he's at a lighthouse, and this old lady shows up and says, I see you in the past. I see you in 1912. And so and he, he looks at it. So he looks at an old picture of an old woman, and he's going to be like, man, she used to be fucking hot. Yeah. I better travel back in time to fuck her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, she used to be hot. Yeah. Yeah. And then he travels back in time and he makes it. And then there's something with a penny. And, you know, it's a it's a very like it's a very Twilight Zone. Yeah. It's the extended Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. The way I did that is that I just fucking took a flashlight, I jammed it in a bunch of pillows or printed out a picture from Pioneer Woman. I taped this to the top of the pillows and I just fucking went to town on that. And next thing I know, I'm yeah, I'm banging Jane Seymour. And I'll tell anybody that that's real because I've done it. You just told a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> Time travel in Alaska. Like, how would you even know? You're just like in a forest again. Exactly. Yeah. But for proof of time travel in the Alaska Triangle, Mike points towards a photo that made the rounds on Twitter back in 2019 that showed a girl who looks almost exactly like climate activist Greta Thunberg. This little girl was working at a gold mine. Greta Thunberg ain't working no mine. (laughs) (laughs) The location of that gold mine, the Canadian Yukon, right next to the Alaska Triangle. What's Mike's contention? That many of the missing people in Alaska are actually Mm time-traveling, having accidentally walked through one temporal portal or another, either to the future or to the past. And to answer your question, yes, they probably wouldn't have much of an idea as to if they had traveled to the future or the past because they're probably still just in the woods. Yeah, they're in the woods. It wouldn't mean anything. And they are actually probably they are time-traveling, but they're doing it the old-fashioned way getting blackout drunk and all of a sudden it's morning Uh, it's alaska they they get really really drunk it's very very cold in other examples of people just disappearing mike recounted the tale of a village of inuits found abandoned by a fur trapper named joe labelle according to the trapper 30 people inhabited this village he knew that for a fact but all of them had vanished so suddenly that a pot of stew was still cooking over a fire when labelle arrived when the bell told the local Mounties what he'd found, they said that they had seen, independently of Mike's report, a group of mysterious blue glowing lights in the sky the night before, indicating that this may have been a mass alien abduction or a portal incident. A portal incident is just a great name for an album. The portal <laughs> incident? Portal <laughs> incident. Yeah, the other, that's a good, uh, yeah, prog rock album. That's like the third Yes album. Yes. <laughs> and when it comes to alien abduction tales, the Alaska Triangle has plenty. One of the more interesting was from 2008, when a hunter in Marshall, Alaska, encountered a young boy in the woods who was confused and disoriented. 
Now, the hunter knew the boy personally. And once the kid got his bearings, he described being, quote unquote, brought into a nearby mountain where he met a girl who asked him what year it was. Man, I just I, I am waiting for the day when someone asks me, what year is it? <laughs> I want it so bad. Just the idea of just being I, ah, it's so hard to be to experience the phenomenon, man. It's yeah. got to happen to you. If someone asked you what year is it, would you tell the truth? Of course I'd tell the truth. <laughs> you wouldn't say 1973. It'd That's probably, what I'd do. <laughs> It'd probably take me a second. You know, <laughs> hey, what year 20, is it? 20, 20, it's 2024. 20, How right. old am I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine, yeah. yeah. You're when you're supposed to be. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny, though, because we have seen many, many alien abduction stories that include that style of questioning, being like, where am I? Where where do you work? Like, what year is this? You know, this is a it's a thing that aliens do. Don't know whether or not it's a trick question just to fuck with you. But essentially, it's also them trying to find their temporal space. Well, no, no, no. This is a little girl that's asking the little boy. Uh, like she's not an alien. <laughs> like she's not herself a fucking alien. dude. No, she's not an alien, dude, because that's my whole fucking point. When he told her, she said that she'd been in the mountain for 40 years. Yet she had not aged because this is not necessarily a time travel story. This is an interdimensional story. See, the mountain in question, Pilcher Mountain, another terrible name. Yeah, they did kind of work on it. They really do. Has long been associated with encounters involving the Irchen Chach, who figure heavily in Inuit folklore. Much like the Puckwudgies in the Bridgewater Triangle, who I know you love the Puckwudgies, Henry. Of course. They're troublemakers. They're fun. They work in a group. And I like that. And they're little. And they pull your pants up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah puck witch. That's the yeah. Puck witch. <laughs> That's the Puck witch. <laughs> the Irchin Huck are small human-like creatures who seem to serve no purpose but to vex humanity. In the 2008 case... The Air Chin Huck's only purpose seems to be to abduct a boy, show him to the scared little girl, then set the boy free to tell the story for reasons unknown. But here's where things get interesting. This is where things get interesting. See, the Air Chin Huck have been said by the elders of the Inuit to have come from another dimension for centuries to appear and disappear as they please in our world. Much like other fairy creature folklore around the world, time is said to work differently in the Ear Chin Hawk's dwelling. All of this sounds like aliens, dog. Well, according to legend, a day in the dwelling of an Ear Chin Hawk is equivalent to a year on Earth. So if the boy's story is true, then the girl would have only been in that dimension for 40 days, which would account for why she had not aged and yet said it had been 40 years since she left. So did they ever find the girl? No. Was no. that, little kids are liars. <laughs> no, 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 no. She's been See, abducted. I didn't think about that. I did that <laughs> no, thought. No, that no, 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 no. The kids are liars. <laughs> no, no, no. They, she has been taken by the ear. <laughs> because when you, you never know. But it does mirror how many times every single society has a story of sort of a trickster-like energy. That is, again, we've, this is, this all fits into Jacques Vallée's theory that these guys are all, in this, they all went to the same high school. <laughs> and it's also the the theory of like if you go to these trickster the dimensions or the the dwellings of these tricksters that time moves much slower there than it does here so when you enter and when you when you enter into it when you leave it'll be well in your mind it'll be you know an hour two hours and it'll end up being like six months or something well that's very specific it's more that time doesn't work there that there is no such thing as time when you're outside of our temporal world we made up time dog what do you think about that? I think time made us up. <laughs> well, what, well, all right. All right. Now we're going to get into it. This is it. All right. I go. I'm ready to fight. <laughs> but while there's plenty of interdimensional beings on the ground, from what the legends say, there have been dozens, if not hundreds, of legitimate UFO sightings in the air above the Alaska Triangle, including a rare encounter with a passenger jet. We just blew one up. Yeah. In 1886, Japan Airlines Flight 1628 encountered a UFO in the Alaska Triangle. Pilot Kinju Tereuchi saw unidentified lights that were keeping pace with the plane, but when he radioed the sighting to Anchorage Air Control, they reported no other active flights nearby. Suddenly, two UFOs appeared in front of the jet and shot off lights that caused the cockpit to heat up. 
Then the UFOs emitted jets of fire for several seconds before stopping and joining a small circle formation of other UFOs that continued keeping pace with the plane. Now, from Teriuchi's recollection, the UFOs were about the size of a DC-8, which, if you'll remember, was the airplane L. Ron Hubbard said was the plane of choice for Scientology's evil galactic overlord Xenu, who mm -hmm. had, if I remember correctly, golden DC-8s equipped with rocket engines to bring aliens to Earth so he could drop them into volcanoes, after which their souls could then be collected, brainwashed, and attached to humanity as ingrams that could only be cleared by copious amounts of auditing in a rundown building in Burbank. So that's what happened. Uh, and that'll be 150 grand. <laughs> um, for anybody who just saw that, yes. I mean, yeah, you haven't spoken a lie yet. <laughs> but back to the flight. The UFO followed the Japan Airlines jet for over 400 miles, but it disappeared into thin air once a United Airlines jet flew into the same space. Not surprisingly, though, in addition to UFOs, the Alaska Triangle is also rife with USOs or unidentified submersible. Objects. I never even thought about that. But yeah, dog. <laughs> no, no. You remember your mind with I that? Because yeah, yeah. they, they come from everywhere. Honestly, there's more people that believe that if there is indeed a phenomenon, you know, I've heard the term people talk about like we might be dealing with a natural thing that we don't fully, we can't identify yet. Something about co things coming out of the ocean and shooting into the atmosphere. But if all the stuff that the U.S. Navy and Air Force are currently seeing, they're all popping out of the ocean. It's yeah. all coming up from the bottom. So there is actually probably a lot more USOs than UFOs. So, yeah. you, but what if UFOs and USOs are the same thing? Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. And then because an alien submarine could just go into the water and then fly out whenever the fuck it wants. It's exactly. called transmedium flight. <laughs> That's literally a thing they talk about. It's a part of the issues is why we don't know whether or not for a long time if, if UFO talk is a screen for technology that some other country has that we don't have because what we are looking for the secret the reason why the US government is taking UFOs vaguely seriously or they they say that they're taking them vaguely seriously is because they're trying to harness this ability uh, to be able to go from air to ocean without losing speed or losing trajectory going in and out it would be a much better place to hide you know 70% of the earth is ocean exactly you're, now you're seeing and you see you understand now you're, getting you're getting it bud good glad <laughs> You're not gonna be able to have sex with your wife after this. Yeah, that's I how this is, is gonna start. Yeah. Is that what fucking happens? Yeah, I don't know. You're just not gonna like remember the starting lineup of like the 1994 Miami Dolphins it, anymore. It just awesome. deletes it. It deletes it's get a couple of things. Lewis Oliver, number 25. <laughs> John Offord on 50. Wait, we'll try again next week. <laughs> next week, <but> Dwight Hollier. <laughs> 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 from your grave. Well, starting in the 40s, crews out at sea in the Alaska Triangle saw dark spheres rising from the ocean before flying away, red-orange elliptical UFOs shooting out of the water at thousands of miles an hour, and rows of red lights floating parallel to ships before disappearing. And what we get from the emails from our listeners and what we get you know, when people talk to us at live shows, um, our Navy people, they see this shit all the time. All the time. All this the time. is a, it is a, it is so common that now they are, it's all, that's why they are making big changes to uh, the reporting of seeing these things. Because yeah. again, for a long time, we were just afraid. We just didn't know whether or not it was China. And my, my theory is that if China had these, they'd be zapping us with them all the time. They need us. Well, for the longest time. They buy all their shit. True. But for the longest time, like people wouldn't report these stories because it, it makes you it crazy. Sound crazy, you know, yeah, and yeah. they could, you know, you could lose a promotion. You can lose whatever if you're saying like, hey, I saw some shit. But then finally, within the last, you know, I guess like five, 10 years, somewhere on that, like enough people have kind of come together and said, like, we really need to start talking about this shit because it happens a lot. We got to look at it. We yeah. got to look at it. Yeah. Like a fucking, you know, an airline pilot might even be like grounded if he said like, hey, I saw some weird shit out there. Not anymore, man. They need those pilots. Yeah, they do. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I saw a real, man, my pilot to the last flight I took coming back from Raleigh, he just looked so tired. And then I was just like, oh, God, it was just fucking. Just be careful, man. You gotta fucking go to sleep, man. That's why you always gotta smuggle cocaine with you. Get oh, yeah, I always do. And I go, I'm like, hey, right. hey, want you wanna read it too? You wanna want fucking Colombian pick me up? Wants a bump. You wanna keep up? You wanna bump? You wanna bump? You wanna bump? Bump, 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 bump. Go to meet me in the bathroom. But even Next though thing you know, I'm fucking this pilot. 
<laughs> sucking my dick for cocaine. Oh, hey, amen. Sky Miles. <laughs> Just nice. I never licked a man's neck so much. <laughs> <laughs> but even though UFOs always play heavily in triangle lore, a similar phenomenon, if we're talking interdimensional beings, is the consistent appearance of cryptids, both land and waterborne. Yes. Now, it's probably not surprising but because there's so much wilderness in Alaska, they got their own Sasquatch. Oh, yeah. Of course they do. It's known locally as either the stick man, the hairy man, or the bush man. Did you see those guys? Honestly, they did a great video with um, Jenna Jameson back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> to the Inuit, the bush man is known as Nanti Nook, and written accounts of the creature go as far back as 1786. I personally believe that if Bigfoot, as a physical creature, exists anywhere, it would be in Alaska. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's impossible to search all of it. Yeah. It's extremely difficult. But as opposed to the more peaceful and solitary Bigfoots in the Pacific Northwest or Florida, the boreal Sasquatch is, like other cold-weather squatches, like the Yeti and the Wendigo, it's highly dangerous. Yeah. Even if you're out in the wilderness just trying to mind your own business. Territorial. I never really understood that because largely other areas of Bigfoot. I mean, like, meh. Maybe it's the difference between like a black bear and a polar bear. Yeah, because like they're viewed for some reason. Cold weather Bigfoots are always more dangerous. They hurt people. Yeah, where crazy. everything else is. <laughs> I don't know. I guess, but they it's they're cold. used they're used to it. They're built for it. So I wouldn't it actually be where they wouldn't they be uncomfortable if they were hot? Polar bears are more cranky than black bears. Exactly, we know no, that they're deadlier because yes. they're cold. <laughs> well, I think it's because they're more food. But the polar bears is because they're trying to eat, and because their resources are so scarce, they're always drowning. Right when we're doing that to them, where they, I feel like with Bigfoots, they are largely vegetarian. They probably eat birds, squirrels. They're not eating people That's for not meat, vegetarian. but they're like they're what they are. Well, gorillas don't eat people for meat. Hippopotamuses are vegetarian. They kill the fuck out of people. Yeah. But they, but just because people are there, because you're fucking yeah. with their babies. I don't yeah, know. You show up, you're going to get fucked up. Yeah, you that might, is true. You might be onto something. It's true. Very, much more, they have to be much more territorial because there's a lot more space they can afford to be. Yeah. Yeah. Bigfoot in the uh, Pacific Northwest can't really afford to be all that territorial. What with the encroachment yeah. of people? More liberal politics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they know that if anyone sees them, they're bringing more people. They're going to come kill him and his family. So mm -hmm. he fucking kills them first. Yep. And maybe. Well, the most well-known story comes from 1905, when a guy named Albert Petka encountered the Bushman in an unprovoked attack, which happened either on shore or on the boat where Petka lived in the Alaska Triangle. And the details surrounding the assault are unknown. But Pekka was able to make it to civilization after the attack, where he said the Bushman savagely beat him but was chased off by Petka's dogs. Petka then died of his injuries without giving any more details. Bigfoots are notoriously scared of dogs. Yeah, they really are. It's a strange thing. Yes. 23 years later, a man named John Meyer, known locally as the Dutchman, was assaulted near the town of Ruby in Alaska. Just like Petka, the Dutchman was savagely beaten in an unprovoked attack, and again, the dogs chased him off. But also like Petka, the Dutchman only made it far enough to say... It was the Bushman what done it before he too expired. But what's interesting about the local Alaska Triangle cryptids is that Mike Ricksecker managed to tie one in particular to his time portal theory. That, of course, is the great Thunderbird. I just did this on Tears of a Clown. The thing about Thunderbirds is it's just a big bird. Thunderbird. Yeah. It's just a very large bird. Or a car driven by an Italian man. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> like many indigenous tribes in North America, the Inuits have legends of massive birds. And it's Rick Secker's theory that these so-called big birds were really airplanes that got caught in the time stream. All right. I like that. That it's to me, theory. that's that's creative. That right? is creative because they think theory, they're yeah. seeing big birds, but they're seeing time traveling airplanes. That's a good way to flip it around. That's a good way to confuse somebody at a dinner party. <laughs> and like you say that thought, if you're saying that shit, that Thunderbirds are just future planes that went through time portals, that's how you know you've lost everyone. <laughs> well, the only animal they saw in the Andes were the condors. Yeah. So sure. it, it could. Are there condors up there? Maybe. I would imagine there's some very large birds up there somewhere. Oh, yeah. I bet you, up yeah. There. Yes. Yeah. Well, the strangest legend among the Inuits, though, are the Kushtaka, a.k.a. the Otter Men. Mm. This shit is my favorite shit 
because I've never heard of the Otter Men. I didn't know that the Otter, I didn't know Otter People was a thing. And what I love is one of my favorite factoids the Travel Channel dropped, which is that, do you know, more often than not, the Kushtaka can be invisible. And that doesn't mean they aren't there. They are just hidden by Jeez. their abilities to be invisible Otter Men. <laughs> well, they make themselves known when they want to make themselves known. They go, known. ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Are the otter are the otter men like little tiny dudes or no? They're huge. Really? Yeah. Similar to the skinwalkers of the American Southwest, the otter men are shapeshifters, but appear as half man, half otter. Most of the time, they just sit there with like the blocks, going like <laughs> <laughs> they do the little arms, the little arms, the little blocks. Otters will fuck you up. Too. Yeah, yes, they will. They're eight feet tall. And they have glowing eyes, needle teeth, and long tails. But what makes them truly disturbing is that they have human hands and feet. That sounds like more otter than man. Yeah, sure. So you said half and half. Oh, sure. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but since they are, after all, half man, they do communicate. Oh, okay. So there's something that makes them a little more man-like. Although their method of communication is a high-pitched three-part whistle. They're birds. <laughs> they're oh. otter men. No, they're, they make otter a, men. they're otter men, and they make different noises. It's kind of like how Bigfoot's the cry, you think it would be deep, but an actual Bigfoot cry is a, ah! Or it's like the otter men, they go in little whistles. because. They're, but they're also known as the demon men. Demon men, they don't like it. Apparently, the Kushtaka, you're not supposed to bring it up amongst the Inuit people. Yeah, they're evil creatures. They lure people into the forest to either kill them or turn them into more otter men. Yeah, man. They flip so they, you. So we could be turned into otter men? Oh, yeah, dude. Conceivably. Many things could happen. I love a good otter man. A good otter man? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your feet ah. up. <laughs> but you don't want it to be a real otter man. You, know, you want to put your feet anywhere near that guy. No. Oh, my feet! Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> well, those otter men, their most nefarious deed is capturing souls after a person's death, which prevents the soul from reincarnating. Presumably, those souls are what the Ottermen use to make more Ottermen. God, it's like Ursula. Yeah. Or Xenu. Whoa, it is like Xenu. Man, Ottermen are weird. This is a very specific Alaska cryptid. This is very, yeah. very strange. But now that we've covered cryptids, aliens, UFOs, shipwrecks, and disappearances, it begs the question as to what is coming through these portals. As some of you versed in the spooky already know, a theory for hauntings is that the veil between the spirit world and the corporeal is but a membrane of dimension. God damn, you talk pretty. <laughs> yeah, once you give him a kiss, once you kiss Thank him you. now, you kiss that small boy, you kiss that book learning child. God damn that mouth of yours. <laughs> Speak poetry. God damn that mouth and this wedding ring on my finger. <laughs> <laughs> now, being as it is a state of tragedy, Alaska mm. is a haunted place. Extremely haunted. Yeah. I, that, I of all of the phenomena that we're talking about, because I the Kushtaka is interesting because people do freak out, right? They don't like the Kushtaka, and it's a thing that if you bring up, apparently you can get into a fight, right? And if, if you go to a locals-only bar in Alaska. But this place is for certain haunted as balls. Yeah. One of the most haunted buildings in Alaska is the historic Anchorage Hotel, which is one of the few buildings in Anchorage to survive the Great Earthquake of 1964, which killed 131 people and destroyed much of the city. But out of the many ghosts hanging around that hotel, one of the more famous is Black Jack Sturgis. Oh, yeah, he always splits tents. Yeah, Black Jack. <laughs> <laughs> See, Black Jack was the police chief in Anchorage in the early 1920s, but was shot in the back and killed with his own gun. His murder was never solved, but it's said that his ghost returns to the scene on the anniversary of his death to search for clues as to who killed him. That's it. That's yeah, it. man. He yeah. just continues. Like he dropped his gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just bounced off of a rock, and it's just him constantly finding himself. Oh, no. Something oh, bit me. <laughs> Something bit me. <laughs> In addition to Blackjack, guests at the historic Anchorage have reported other ghosts, including that of a woman who hanged herself after her fiancé left her for the gold rush, a happy little boy prancing about. You can't kill me again. <laughs> you can't kill me again. I'm in hell. <laughs> and 
an insane old woman, gibbering and jabbering. Was that her name? Yeah, yep. gibbering and jabbering. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's from gibbering, Alaska. Her oh, name's okay. jabbering. Yeah. <laughs> but from what it seems, hotels are the haunting hotspots in Alaska, as both the Captain Cook Hotel and the Alaskan Hotel in Juneau have both reported high amounts of ghost activity. I would put it towards the fact that it's a lot of seasonal workers. Yeah. The everything changes. People come in. We we be, you know, referring to what I actually know. So we're talking about the Robert Hansen episodes, which is the idea that people come in and out. There's a lot of tragedy, a lot of sex workers coming in. They also follow the trail of people that are the seasonal workers. They're the oil people, the people that work on the various places like that are only open in the summer months in a very, very cold place. And so uh there is a lot of tragedy. There's a yeah. lot yeah. of murder. There's a lot of crime associated yeah. with these frontier towns where everyone's hammered lonely and crazy yeah yes yeah it's a bad recipe it, it is. is when the captain cook the ghost of a woman who died by suicide in a bathroom reportedly haunts the hotel as a poltergeist causing doors to fly open and faucets to turn on and off and yet no maintenance crew has ever been able to find a practical reason behind either phenomenon as far as the Alaskan Hotel goes, it's haunted by the ghost of a woman who was murdered in room 219 by her boyfriend, again, during the gold rush. And it's said she still inhabits the room to this day. Just like, couldn't you have killed me in San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> there was also the case of a sailor who stayed in the most haunted room in the hotel, room 315. Supposedly, the sailor was so scared of what he experienced that he threw himself out of the window of the room, and the walls of his room were found to be covered in blood. Fuck yeah! This happened in 2007. Yeah! But the sailor has since recovered from his ordeal. Oh, he didn't die? No, he jumped out the window and survived. It was probably second story. Yeah. So there was blood on the walls, even though he jumped out the window. Yeah. I think there had been, I think he had probably hurt himself in the room. Uh, well, it's blood, the, oh, it's blood raining from the walls, which we know is a common thing people report during poltergeist activities. Like, you know, Did anyone else blood. see the blood? I don't think so. Was it his blood? Eddie, just let's just let's just ease up, okay? <laughs> okay, this is a ghost story. <laughs> yeah. We can't I, I get got, down I to got, the nitty gritty here. I got a morsel of information on this. You I got know, a, like, a, let's a, just a paragraph. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's one of my favorite haunting locations, the haunted bar. The Red Onion Saloon in Skagway has two spirits, one that appears as a woman hanging by a noose and another that appears as a large, boorish man who creates a dark, oppressive air. I bet they knew each other. (laughs) (laughs) This is a guy just having dying of sleep. You hear him have sleep apnea. Yeah, it's just (laughs) funny. No, he's the the character you used to do on Round Table all the time. The I'm sorry guy. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I just came in here. I was bleeding. I'm sorry. Oh, my Band-Aid fell off again. And I can't find it. I can't find it. <laughs> sorry. I'm scabby everywhere. I have psoriasis. My medicine's missing. Can you help me find it? I can't <laughs> sleep without my mask. Where's my mask? <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you out there might be saying, so what? Fuck so you! There's, <laughs> so there's a lot of death and unexplained phenomena in Alaska, a place that's massive, largely unexplored, full of tragedy, and holds the distinction of being one of the most dangerous places in America this side of Death Valley. Some of you might even be saying, okay, granted, there's these portals and vortices, but what do you do with an Alaskan triangle? You film a travel channel television show there. Apart from that, what do you practically, what do you do with it? I mean, I think we need to add this. We need to make it a square or something. We got to figure out because it is not, ah, maybe make the triangle smaller. Well, according to some, the United States government is taking full advantage of the increased electromagnetic properties in the Alaska Triangle through the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, a.k.a. HARP. You will let me inside of their Meyer website, www.jesseventura.com. <laughs> I can't do it, right? <laughs> but like, remember when he tried to get into HARP? 
and they kicked him out. You spent a whole episode. You spent a whole episode outside of the harp because harp is it. It's one hundred percent real. It's okay. a legitimate project that operates out of a very real research facility. And yeah, Jesse Ventura did once stand outside of its gates and just yell and yell and yell. I want in there. Let me in there. Let me in there. <laughs> yeah. It's like no. That's why we built the fence. <laughs> I know. And I made an appointment to arrive. I have made an appointment, and you will let me take the tour because you can take a tour of harp. But yeah. for, this is the problem: is that we want to get a. We we covered the conspiracy theories behind Harp back in the day. It's like episode twenty or something. Back when it was like fresh, but when like, but now it's so hard to do the conspiracy theories about it because it's so obviously not what's happening because it was mostly out of a misunderstanding of what the fuck was happening at Harp. Well, officially, it specializes in analyzing the ionosphere, which is the portion of the atmosphere that stretches from 53 to 370 miles above sea level. And HARP is no small operation. It's 360 radio transmitters and 180 antennas covering over 30 acres of land near Gakona, Alaska. And at the heart of the facility is a very impressive sounding phased array radar that emits radio waves. In other words, there's some serious shit going down at Harp, or at least some very involved shit. Stuff that sounds scary. Yeah. Yeah. It's stuff that's used to mind control us from Alaska, and it's sending messages into the minds of the American people in order to get us, help us to believe that what the fucking president says is real. It's a mind control device, and they're beaming it everywhere, dog. It's why we're fucking, everybody gets the new iPhone, man. It's fucking, we're slaves to it, dude. You did just pull one up. That did prove your point. No. <laughs> <laughs> and not like the 16, when we saw the photo, we saw the photo of like someone said that that the, out of the um, United Airline flight, that the door, whatever it was, the Alaska Airline flight, Alaska. Alaska. Don't, don't be smirch United. Nor Delta. It, yeah. I mean, but Alaska Airline, the side of the airplane fell off and they found an iPhone that la landed unscathed from, quote unquote, landed unscathed from 16,000 feet, which I think is a plant. I think it's a fake. I think it's an advertisement from fucking Apple. Absolutely, because everyone knows you drop it out of your pocket and it fucking cracks. My thing's a goddamn mess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you're playing right into it because you've mentioned this on three different shows and have given Apple free advertisement every single time. No, dude, it was before. I didn't actually say it on the shows, but Apple, I mean, they could pay us. <laughs> you could pay us if you wanted to, but I still think it's a fucking psyop, dog. Any coincidence that it's Alaska Airlines? Exactly. Oh, shit, bro. Exactly. Fucking put it in there. Oh, yeah, you. Well, amongst other projects, we're talking about HARP, their current research experiments as of two years ago. And these research experiments are too complicated to go into outside of their names are uh, the Moon Bounce. The Jupiter Experiment hmm. and a partnership with UC Berkeley called Steve. Oh, man, that sounds like a <laughs> Disney show. Yeah, that's Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. Steve. Oh, Steve. Okay. <laughs> but uh, basically, one of the things that they do is they, they are working on a communication satellite. I believe the goal is to bounce messages off the ionosphere in order to... Uh, it's it's about communication and, and radio uh, communication. Yeah. I believe that. But the reason why HARP is connected to conspiracy thought is that its inception is tied to the Cold War, where many government conspiracies, especially the true ones like MKUltra, come from. Basically, projects like HARP were being used to emit extremely low frequency waves, ELF waves for short, to communicate with submerged submarines. ELF projects, however, were scuttled in the lower 48 after facilities in Michigan and Wisconsin made nearby residents sterile, stupid, and riddled with cancer. It's bad. That is, and that's enough of a conspiracy. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not a conspiracy. That just happened. Yeah, they just poisoned a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah. And so the study of ELF waves was brought to a more remote location in Alaska. This was ushered in by Senator Ted Stevens, who was the guy who said that the internet was a series of tubes. To remind you of that claim, Henry will now read you Ted's old man rant that he gave about just this subject in Congress. Ten movies streaming across that that internet, and what happens to your own personal internet? I just the other day got an internet was sent by my <laughs> staff at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. I got it Tuesday. Why? Because it got tangled up with all these things going on on the internet commercially. They want to deliver vast amounts of information over 
the internet. And again, again, the internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's a series of tubes. And if you don't understand, these tubes can be filled. And if they are filled, when you put your message in, it gets in line, right? And it goes, and it's going to be delayed by anyone that puts into that tube enormous amounts of material. Enormous amounts of material. <laughs> my was... daughter, my daughter won't call. <laughs> <laughs> this was the man who, at the time, was heavily involved in debates that were regulating the internet. You oh, know, that God. make the rules that form our world today. My son dresses like a cactus. <laughs> Why is everybody hanging out with Care Bears? What's happening? Do I, do, uh, what's a Pikachu? <laughs> <laughs> but Ted Stevens was also highly involved in HARP, saying in public that they were going to harness the Aurora Borealis, quote unquote, down to earth so it could be used to solve the energy crisis. I went out there with two big nets. We knew we had to catch the Borealis and bring it down, put it into sacks, distribute it amongst my constituents. Each one of you will get one section of the Aurora Borealis. It's going to help your tubes. <laughs> this, of course, didn't work. And all this may go a little way towards putting away some conspiracy theories when you really take a close look at who is actually in charge of this country. But after the Cold War, Harp pivoted to more scientific pursuits until 9-11. After that, it was used to study ways to counter the effects of high-altitude nuclear detonation, which would cripple low-Earth satellites. But there are some who believe that HARP has far more nefarious, far more dangerous, and far more powerful functions than being a simple monitoring and research station. Most of those conspiracies say that HARP uses an antenna to manipulate the high-frequency range, which allows them to do everything from controlling the weather to controlling People. It's one of those things where if they did, if they could do this, they would be using it. I think they'd be used. But then I guess that's why, because that's what convinced us all, you know, because I mean? the most up to date versions of Harp is talking about how that that's what in coordinations with the um, 5G crystals that have been put into our blood because of the uh, the uh, series of war crimes called the COVID-19 vaccines that were rolled out on all of us as that harp is going to harness those like mitochlorians from the vaccines in our <laughs> blood in order to turn us into, I believe, turn Jedi? us into trans people. No, unfortunately, <laughs> it is changing as I believe that is one of the actual theories. Yeah. And it's flipping us. I wouldn't harp on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harp has actually been nicknamed the Area 51 of Alaska, and it's been blamed for. I remember this stuff so well. Yeah. It got blamed for Hurricane Katrina, yep. Hurricane Sandy, yep. and a false flag attack on North Korea. Mm -hmm. That didn't take, though. And it's not just internet theorists who jumped on this bandwagon. In 2008, a Russian military journal described HARP as a geophysical superweapon, which can, for lack of a better term, fuck with the ionosphere above other countries to slowly drive them mad and slowly kill them by burning a specific hole in the ozone layer, which would allow deadly cosmic radiation to seep through. Even old Hugo Chavez, if you remember him. Do you remember yeah! him? Yeah! Now, who's he again? For a Venezuelan dictator. Oh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That guy. He said that the 2010 Haitian earthquake, that, remember that bad one? That yeah. killed like 100,000 yeah, people? Fucking, yeah. We all donated and they stole our money and fucking made stupid shit. Well, watch how John stole the money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hugo Chavez said that that was caused by the testing of a tectonic weapon developed by the United States. The Venezuelan press subsequently wrote that the earthquake may have been associated with Project Harp. And now we come to Dr. Nick Begick. If you will remember from the beginning of this episode, the politician Hale Boggs, the one whose plane disappeared, was out raising money for a congressman named Nick Begick. And Dr. Nick Begick is Congressman Nick Begick's son. I hate this fucking name <laughs> yeah. so much. Is that real? Is his name really Nick Begick? Yeah, I, well, I don't, I can't see how else. Or is it, it would Begich? Be. Maybe Begich? it's Begich. Maybe it's like. Maybe it's like Budajij. Uh, Bejic? It might be Bejic. It might be Bejic. It might be Bejic, but I will just, I mean, you just see Nick Begick and you got to read it like Nick Begick. I'm looking at this now. I'm looking to see if I could get, is that you pronounce it? Nick Begok? Begok! 
<laughs> Mark Begich. It is be- it is Begich. <laughs> it's Begich. Okay. Just check. Okay. Begich. Okay, so it's Nick Begich. Dr. It's still Nick- a horrible name. Nick mm-hmm. Begich. Um, I don't know. I just like Nick Begich. Yeah, must, I do too. Uh, but, but I'll say Begich. Nick Begich. It must be said, however, that Nick Begich Jr.'s doctor title... That comes from an honorary doctorate of medicine for independent work in health and political science at the Open International University for Complementary Medicines in Sri Lanka. So I would say that no. calling him doctor is very much optional. Yes. I think it's kind of fun. It seems like it's one of those where as long as you show up with a stethoscope, you're a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, Dr. Nick Begich wrote a highly critical book about the Area 51 of Alaska called Angels don't play this harp. Yeah. <laughs> I think we used that. Didn't we use that for back in the day when we did our, our harp episode? No, we back the back then we didn't use books at all. We looked shit, we seriously looked shit up on the internet like a couple hours before we recorded and just went with it. That was us for like 80 episodes. I think I have this book somewhere. This is so <laughs> funny. I gotta get into this. Because it's Tesla technology. You gotta forget. Uh. This is all yeah. Tesla shit. Same thing with the pyramids being used as batteries. It's this yes. idea that you can make more energy than you want to using a small amount of energy. Yeah. Well, and angels don't play this harp. He claims that harp is capable of firing heat beams through the atmosphere that can penetrate everything living or dead, which sounds a lot like the plot from Plan 9 from Outer Space. Yeah. But no matter its purpose, author Mike Ricksecker believes that harp is only possible because it harnesses the energy of the Alaska Triangle. The fucking Dark Pyramid, dude! This is what I'm fucking saying! The very heart, Mount Denali, dude! And even though, yeah, it is harnessing an energy that is highly scientific and provable, the question remains as to whether there is something else happening in the Alaska Triangle which we do not yet have the methods to prove, but may sometime have in the future if we haven't already had it in the past. Alaska Triangle. It's Alaska, buddy. You got to be careful, man. Always be careful in Alaska. We have our listeners in Alaska. I want to know. I'd still love to do a show in Anchorage. I'd still oh love God. to go to Alaska. I, would, I, wanna, I need to go to Alaska. I want to go to Alaska so fucking bad. I got to go. I want to see some glaciers. They're yeah. I want to see gone. the whole thing. Yeah. I really want to go. Um, Side stories, LPOTL, the gmail.com. I'd love to hear people, because we have a lot of listeners in Alaska, your stories of the unusual. Because it is like much like the the forests of Oregon or outside of like in Washington, like the the Colorado uh, in Europe, like the you know in the UK. It's a very mysterious place. Yes, the triangle might be the entire state, but it really most just shows most yeah. of the state. But it just show that it's weird, and they do it's weird shit. Weird. And yeah. weird shit happens, and it has its own fucking Bigfoot, and it's got the fucking the Otter Man, which I love. I just love the Otter Man. Otter yeah. Man's great. I'm always about him. I'm glad you can't wait to hang out with him and become one later in life. <laughs> yeah, it's a good. It's a good way to flip. It's how it's you stay alive for yeah. longer. You become an Otter Man. You know, <laughs> it'll cure this heart disease. Everything will be great. Perfect. So this is our first foray, Eddie. You've been. You know, you're going to see more about the the capital P phenomena. You're going to learn a lot this month. We're going to be doing more. Uh, you're going to get a little weird. Bring it a little spooky. Very excited. I'm gonna get the you can see. You can see. We're gonna, we're gonna a lot of aliens, a lot of fucking bullshit. Then we're gonna do some hardcore true crime next month. Well, yeah. Luckily, I already forgot everything we said today. Yeah, oh, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those fucking dolphins lineups ain't going nowhere. Woo! Stay fresh. <laughs> fuck you, Kansas City. Come <laughs> <for> your ass. <laughs> Y'all don't stand a fucking chance. I thought you just <laughs> I actually go? thought that you guys just lost the division or whatever. We did lose the division, but the playoffs start this weekend, and we're going to Kansas City and negative four. And we've never, our Tua, my man, he's never won a game uh, in under 40 degrees. So Oof. this is going to be no problem. <laughs> See what happens. They got to start working in a refrigerator. <laughs> Fuck you, Kansas City, with your stupid ribs. So go check out Operation Sunshine. I love Kansas City barbecue. Don't you fucking, that is the yeah. one good thing about that fucking state. Don't you fucking dare. Don't you fucking ever dare, ever. You fucking, I, I'm going to, if I was there, Fuck if I was yeah. there. You ever actually had Kansas City barbecue, though? I've had like I've never been to Kansas City, but I've had Kansas City. There, it's delicious. I know it's delicious. 
Kansas right, City I'm barbecue. I'm just talking shit because we're playing them this week. <laughs> I know. Everything, there's lots of great shit. You want to say shit City. about Patrick Mahomes? He's my fucking alumni. He's an alumni? Yeah, he's you? a tech, he's Texas Tech. Oh, well, he looks like a squid. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah. No, you, yeah, you, you go to shit. you fucking fly in a lot, but you fly in a fucking Preston Smith International Airport. First thing you see is a big picture of Patrick Mahomes advertising for McGavick Nissan. Oh, McGavick, McGavick. He's getting all the big contracts, <laughs> getting the big ones. He's I think since, it. Uh, that was a few years ago. I think since he's won like Super Bowls, he doesn't like you know answer McGavick Nissan's calls anymore. Wow. Not because as they much. Use, they use a frog as their uh, as their mask. McGavick, McGavick. You know. Yeah, I think that I think he got sucked up. Yeah, I don't yeah, think I, that he's. Because I think there was a comedy club in Lubbock that was also frog based. Was that place called Gags? <laughs> croaks. <laughs> it, was yeah, croaks. croaks. <laughs> it was called like, um, like Froggy's Flip Room. <laughs> like, I know there was a karaoke. Gigan. Yeah. Gigan. 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 Yeah. yeah Gigan. I know there was that karaoke bar in the strip club called Adolph's. Oh, oh. God. That's great. Um, but check out Operation Sunshine, number four. It's out there. Go and buy it. Local comic book store. Uh, it's the end of our first run. We're going to have four more coming out in two months. You're going to see it's going to complete the sequence. You got anything else to plug? You're about to go do shows in Phoenix. That's right. I'll be doing shows tonight and tomorrow. I get to perform while the Dolphins are beating the Kansas City Chiefs. Hmm. That's going to be very annoying for me. So come and watch me struggle on stage. I'll be at Stand Up Live. And in this week, uh, the brighter side, we talk about the Florida Triangle, the Everglades. Oh, yeah. Lots well, of plane crashes in that, too. Tons, oh, yeah. So many plane crashes skunk lately apes. with all of us. A lot, a lot of people dropping apes. off drugs. A lot of people dropping off drugs. Oh, yeah. Um, they go mission, they never get fired. I don't know where that cocaine <laughs> went. Uh, hail <laughs> Satan. Hail oh, again. Hail uh, Inuits. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. they're yeah. great people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bye. Wow. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.